Apple wants to convince you that HomeKit is safe, but they're getting rid of the escape key, Xiaomi's new ceramic phone, and self-driving beer. All that and a whole lot more coming up on Tech News Today. This is Twit. Bandwidth for Tech News Today is provided by CashFly at C-A-C-H-E-F-L-Y dot com. This is Tech News Today, episode 1627, recorded Tuesday, October 25th, 2016. This episode of Tech News Today is brought to you by Epson's new EcoTank printers. With Epson's line of SuperTank all-in-one printers, you can print thousands of documents without running out of ink. EcoTank is loaded and ready to print when you are. Visit epson.com slash EcoTank to find out more. Welcome to Tech News Today. This is a show where we talk about everything that went down today in technology. This is us. We're like, yeah, oh, we just can't stop talking about all the things, although there was too many things today. There were a lot of things today. Yeah. I'm Megan Maroney. I'm Jason Howell. How are you doing? <laughs> Good. It's been a day. Yeah. But dang it, I'm ready to talk technology news. Are you? I'm ready. Let's do it. All right. Apple reported fourth quarter earnings today. The stock is down. Uh, and for the third quarter in the in a row, the stock is down for the year. Mm. That's the third mm. quarter in a row. It's down for the year. iPhone sales were down from this time last year. In case you're counting, that's 45.5 million iPhones sold compared to last year's 48.05 million. So still a giant pile of iPhones. Revenue also shrank 9.8% to 46.9 billion from the same period one year earlier. They reported 9.3 million iPads sold last quarter and 4.9 million Macs, which was also down from the same quarter last year. And yet they still beat investors' estimates, which is often the most important part of the story. Apple's big quarter is the one after the holiday season. So we'll see what happens then. Do not panic yet. <sighs> it's Apple. Don't panic. They're doing all right. Even even though this is, I would say, for the company, one of the biggest challenges, the biggest hurdles that they're regularly having to face. This is the first annual revenue drop since 2001. So, you know, there's a lot of firsts happening this this year as far as kind of their, their growth monetarily. They're still doing great. It's just they were used to, you know, like phenomenal, you know, figures. And now they're not quite seeing it. No sales numbers for the Apple Watch. That's still lumped into the products category, the, the other, other products category, yeah. um, which that category in general is down 22% year over year. It would be great at this point with the second iteration to kind of know, do you think maybe they they keep lumping it there because they don't, because they're not, they're not happy with what they're seeing? Uh, I don't know. I just think they don't want to say probably. They're not ready. I mean, if they, if they say something and it's disappointing, then they're basically discounting a whole category. Right. And that yeah. could be detrimental to to kind of the progress. Right. If it were amazing, of course they would say, right? right. Like, why yeah. wouldn't they say? So it's not amazing, but is it good enough? Probably. I mean, really, they're looking at, I mean, everyone wants to look at the iPhone 7. Um, you know, that's the newest phone. It was, you know, some pretty major changes. Um, you know, there were only a few weeks of sales of the iPhone 7 in this quarter's results, so right. they don't have anything to do with that. Um, so, uh, but they did talk a lot about Internet of Things in the earnings call, um, and of course, you know, the Mirai botnet that we saw last week was, you know, these Chinese products, cameras that were insecure and the creators were not making them secure. They were um, hard to change the default password, um, hard to know if you needed security updates. So they did a big push there in HomeKit, mm -hmm. which is, you know, their Internet of Things platform, um, which they say is secure. They say 100 secure HomeKit uh, compatible products will be on the market by the end of this year, so 100 new products. So that that was really they, you know, they got in on that weak spot, um, saying, you know, if you really want secure Internet of Things, then try, you know, the the home kit. Right. Uh, another thing that's really working for them, and you know, what they're kind of shifting focus, Apple's shifting focus a little bit away from the kind of the difficulties in phone hardware is services, and basically, you know, their streaming services, their cloud services, uh, services grew 24 percent. $6.3 billion over the same period last year. So that's going strong. That's good. And actually, um, Apple also kind of offered its guidance for next quarter, which obviously it's the holiday quarter. 
It's where, you know, like you said, iPhone 7 really was only two weeks of, of this uh, quarter. So you're going you're gonna to have a lot of those sales end up on that one, likely sell very well through the holidays, could be a big jump over expectations. Apple estimates it might break all-time quarterly revenue records uh, in December. So I think look, things are probably looking all right for Apple, I, even though it's, it's easy to see something like this and kind of glom onto the stuff we're not used to seeing from Apple, which is, oh my goodness, you know, revenue dropping, whatever. But I think they're doing okay. Mm -hmm. We're used to seeing leaks of marquee products ahead of their official unveiling, but you have to wonder whether leaks uh, from inside the company or, you know, they're coming, you know, is it accidental basically, or is that intentional as we're seeing here ahead of this Thursday's expected Apple reveal of a number of Mac upgrades. Yesterday's Mac OS Sierra 10.12.1 software update actually contained some hidden images of its upcoming MacBook Pro refresh showing for the first time official images of the OLED touch panel that is that has since been or you know prior to this rumored to sit above the number row on the keyboard to replace the function keys. Uh, not only is this confirmation of the product's existence, it also visually confirms that touch ID is integrated into the OL OLED screen itself. You can see it right here where a little kind of uh, informational, you know, Apple Pay message comes up. And I think it was tied to the Apple Pay, uh, something hidden inside Apple Pay functionality inside the OS. But you can see touch uh, to pay Apple, you know, whatever the amount is, and this little portion of the touch strip or of the OLED strip is a touch uh, surface for your finger uh, fingerprint. And uh, yeah, I, I mean, it also kind of shows off how the OLED panel is changing contextually to match certain functions on the laptop. I'm super excited about this because I know we're getting one um, at our house. We, we need to upgrade to this. So I'm excited. And so will you use Apple Pay on, on your laptop, do you think? Um, well, it's my it's my wife's laptop. She's upgrading. Um, and I don't know. That's a really good question because she is Android. So I don't know if... I, I, I don't know. Does does uh, OS C, uh, Mac OS Sierra have, uh, you know, Apple Pay functionality that doesn't require an iPhone, a, it, like an iOS device to to facilitate? I'm assuming that here is a really good question. I'm assuming here maybe not because it's using your laptop, but I don't know if it uses the device as a conduit or. I something. think they would probably let anyone um, use Apple probably Pay. Probably so. Yeah. yeah, but I don't know. I, I guess it remains to be seen. Still, it would be really nice to have some sort of a fingerprint kind of security yeah. on your laptop. That's a feature that I would love to have. Yeah, I, uh, I'm i excited about this. They say that it's going to be called the Magic Toolbar. Ooh, the everything's magic, magic in the world <laughs> the of Apple. The Magic Keyboard, the Magic Mouse. The, <laughs> so the Magic Toolbar, that like a patent says that they, they, they're pretty sure that's going to be the name. And Ming-Chi Kuo says... Um, that, that the new MacBooks will have the most significant update ever. So I don't, um, that'll be exciting. They're missing an escape button. Does that bother you at all? Uh, maybe it would if I encounter an issue, but I have to imagine that Apple's probably got that figured out. Like, well, what do you do? I, I don't know. How often do you use the escape button, actually? Well, now that I'm thinking about it, I don't know if I really use the escape button that uh, often. I use it when I'm in full screen and something, like okay. YouTube or whatever. But, okay. I mean, I just wonder, like, it's, you know, just... I just wonder if that's going to be like, ah, oh, my escape what? button's my, gone. What happened oh. to my escape button? Well... Like, I mean, I mean, I'm guessing because of the way that this this touch panel is and the way it changes contextually, you know, maybe right there in this case, it's it can, canceled. It's a cancel right. replaces the escape because that makes the most sense in that in that you know, part right. of the. Yeah, I don't think they're going to leave you without a way to get out of full screen. Um, yeah, from exactly. The keyboard. Right. Oops, we left that out. Dang it. We're <laughs> Apple, but we're not perfect. I wish folks. we had watched Tech News today. No, but I think it's interesting. Just the terminology, like escape, is so like that's yeah. such old terminology. Like, what are you escaping from, really? Like, cancel is just calmer and more soothing, more yeah. iPhone-ish. Like, you know, iPhone never had an escape button. I imagine escape will still appear in some way because otherwise, well, I don't know. I mean, yeah, maybe maybe they replace it, but I mean, you. Know, there are other parts of the OS that probably refer to that. And if they have to like refer to two different ways of doing something, that doesn't sound very Apple-y. No. Um, so I would imagine it would probably be there. Um, other things that you can glean from this little leaked photo, leaky, you know, just hidden photo that, that was found here. No, well, you can't uh, get any sort of sense of what ports will or will not be included because it's all top-down shots. So you don't see that. But you do see a redesigned hinge, which basically makes it look like it's going to be a much thinner design, which... MacBook Pros generally are the thickest of the bunch, you know, of the of the um, 
of the Mac laptop line. So that would be really nice. Flatter keys, probably the butterfly mechanism that's found in the Retina MacBook. Uh, so, yeah, it's looking like a pretty sharp uh, device. And I should also remind everyone, Thursday, 10 a.m. Pacific, we're doing live coverage here at Twit of the Apple event. It's going to be Megan, myself, and Andy Anako. Uh, so twit.tv slash live. And mm -hmm. we'll be talking all about the things as they announce it. We'll talk more and more about the escape <clears throat> key. Yes, we won't let mystery. this get by. No, we will, we will not. not let them just skirt the or push the escape key under the rug. It's escape key gate. Yeah. <laughs> Mary jo Joe Foley at ZDNet says Microsoft is open sourcing its contrib contribution to the growing field of deep learning. Cognitive Toolkit, still in beta, allows developers to make use of deep learning techniques in their apps and their services. A team of computer scientists focus, focusing on speech recognition and natural language processing developed Cognitive Toolkit, which now includes native support for Python and C++ in order to speed up adoption. The code is available now on GitHub and available via an MIT open source license. And this is the same tool that we told you about last week that distinguished itself by performing better than many professional transcriptionists. Now, in case you're wondering why uh, we're seeing such a deluge of AI right now, Microsoft's chief speech scientist and developer of the Microsoft Cognitive Toolkit told the register that a combination of large data sets, better computing infrastructure, and deep learning have combined to create all these sudden advances in this field. Yeah, everybody's got so much going on in this, in this, and I imagine it's just a snowball that's getting bigger and bigger, faster and faster. Um, yeah, you had mentioned it. It uh, has Python support. It lacked this up until now. Um, Python uh, three specifically, Python two support they say is coming someday. They're also planning on adding in support for R and C sharp. So. Uh, kind of broadening it out uh, to make everybody a little happy about that. And, uh, yeah, I mean, yeah, we've, we've talked about this a couple of times recently, but uh, it just kind of, you know, applies to speech, text, images, and uh, very powerful stuff to be able to just kind of train this AI in a number of different ways and use it in your own ways. Right, and Google really uh, pioneered this open sourcing of the AI at, uh, with TensorFlow. That's mm -hmm. their similar, um, and there's also Cafe and Torch, and paddle. So really, I mean, I think they're really understanding that open sourcing this um, really helps to make it grow. Like the more data you have, the more contributions from different um, people you have, the faster that it's going to become smarter and then um, be the brains and heart of our robot overlords. Yeah. Or at least like uh, artificial intelligence hackers that will hack into Internet of Things devices and be like, hey, you did that all on your own. We're proud, but we're also scared. <laughs> um, that's how I'll feel about it. I'll be conflicted at that point. I'll be like, I can't believe what technology is capable of, and I want to go to the go to Mars. Uh, Chinese hardware maker Xiaomi might not have much of a U.S. presence at the moment, but its efforts in smartphone design, I think, are always super intriguing, particularly for its low price point. The newly announced Mi Note 2, announced this today, looks a whole lot like the Galaxy Note seven it's got kind of the curved edges and everything minus the stylus so it doesn't have the s pen or the stylus with it uh but it has that edge display you can see it right there and i mean wow the squircle home button on the bottom it's very samsung -y. also shown off and i think a bit more impressively is the ceramic bodied me mix it's a 6.4 inch concept phone that's actually going to go on sale in china next month has a cutting edge bezel-less design uh, it has the genesis of famed uh, designer Philip Stark, uh, who, by the way, designed Steve Jobs' yacht. <laughs> this, like, very famous, crazy-looking yacht way back when. Um, yeah, if you go to the other link, because this is the Note. That, that's the Note one, and the other link is the crazy ceramic device. This is Philip Stark here. I believe it's Philippe. Oh, Philippe. Philippe sorry. Stark. Philippe Stark. <laughs> um, yeah, the video, by the way, is really something else, like... It, it, it's, I mean, you could turn up the audio just a little bit to get a sense for it, but it's super like dramatic and really wants to be super important. But for God, it is in details, it's work, work, millimeters by millimeters by millimeters by millimeters. Yes. Um, so, I mean, you got to respect this guy because he's done, he's done a lot. So but what, what's interesting about this, obviously, it's a ceramic body. So, um, you know, pr from a durability standpoint, is probably pretty great there. Has a 91.3% screen-to-body ratio because the top and the side 
of the display is literally to the very edge. There's no bezel up there. So they had to relocate the front facing camera down to the bottom of the phone, which is weird, but they allow you to turn it upside down. You know, it'd be really weird to like take a, a selfie from down there and it's looking up your nostril. <laughs> um, you know, no one wants that. Uh, but they did a lot of other interesting things too. Ultrasound proximity sensor as opposed to kind of what they used before with kind of like a camera, um, some along those lines. A piezoelectric speaker that uses the metal frame to make sounds as opposed to an actual speaker that cuts through the glass. Um, so that's, that's just kind of rattling the metal and that's what you hear, uh, when you put it up to your ear and it has just great, you know, the specs kind of match to a large degree, the new pixel phones. So I've been thinking about these ceramic phones for a while. Cause that's what the iPhone eight is allegedly going to mm -hmm. be made of. And, you know, I've just been reading about it and it seems like, you know, everyone would love a ceramic phone, um, because uh, you can do um, wireless charging with it. Like it's easier to transmit things uh, through it. But you know, what some scientists have said is like in, in mass, like there's not that much ceramic. Like that's, it's hard to like, it's gonna be hard to like produce that much using mm. the, the, that much. It's hard to mass produce um, so the material of ceramic. So I, I don't know. I mean, I think um, this phone does look beautiful. Um, and you know, it's a little more, higher price it's pricier than some of the me stuff we've seen before i mean mm -hmm. it's still less than an iphone uh i guess you know prices i i saw 515 did you see like 420 yeah, dollars somewhere too yeah, well no so the 420 that i saw was for the me note oh okay. and uh that's the bottom of the range up to 515 and then i think this the me mix is also right around 515 or 520 yeah. something like that but, and I mean, you know, releasing just to China, by the way, this is not, you know, right. something that you're going to find throughout the U.S. And well, you'll probably be able to import it. This isn't this, anywhere. Well, they, but, it's just a concept phone, right? Well, it's a concept phone, but they, they're planned to release it next month oh. uh, in, in at least a limited amount in China. So it's kind of weird like that. Like, yes, it's a concept phone, but they're going to release it to some capacity uh, in China. So they, yeah, the Mi 5 has a ceramic back. Is that true? I think that's what um, I read. So like, the, I guess, but like the full ceramic would be harder to do. But yeah, I think yeah. that. Um, but it looks, it looks pretty and shiny. I know. In I'm their, also, in their video. It does, it does look amazing. And people were amazed on Twitter. Um, I'm also worried, wondering about patents because I mean, Apple has a patent um, that says they, they have a patent for the handheld computing device includes an enclosure having structural walls formed from a ceramic material that is radio transparent. So, hmm. I don't know. So Apple might own the patent for ceramic phone? That they own I, the handheld computing device includes an enclosure having structural walls formed from a ceramic <laughs> material that is radio transparent. Ah, I get it now. Thank <laughs> you for repeating. <laughs> All right. For those of you already listening to this at, um, you know, two plus speed. Yeah, sorry, sorry about, about that. that. <laughs> <laughs> at the Wall Street Journal Tech Conference, AT&T execs said the merger with Time Warner is not going to be all about sticking it to us, the consumer. And to that end, they announced a new $35 a month streaming service that includes mobile uh, and will offer 100 channels. The service will debut in November. At first, it will be just over landlines, but then it'll move to 5G wireless connections to be deployed by 2018 and then expand in 2019 and 2020. So $35 a month, not bad for 100 channels. Not bad at all for 100 um, It's channels. called Direct Now. The goal is to increase competition and drive prices down even further. Um, and they will offer unlimited mobile data for your TV viewing. Um, and they're going to have to do a lot of things like this to convince people. I mean, everyone has been complaining about this merger, like um, Al Franken to Donald Trump. Like there's everybody, <laughs> like no matter which side, like, people are like uneasy about this merger. I mean, we've been through a lot of, you know, you hear AT&T and you think about like, don't we keep breaking this company up? Like what's going on here? Right, right, so, right. I don't know. I mean, I like, but I do like $35 a month. I know. That's a pretty good price, uh, pretty good cost to value, you know, sort of thing. They say they can do the lower cost because they don't have to deal with the set-top boxes. They don't have to deal with customer support visits to your home. They don't have to deal with satellite dishes. Uh, I mean, I pay $40 right now for PlayStation View, and I keep forgetting to cancel it, so I continue to pay $40 <laughs> a month. Uh, that gives me access to 60 channels, and I feel pretty happy about that. Is there anything in this news that talks about any sort of cloud DVR uh, associated with this, or is it just live TV? Right. That would be a big differentiator for me. That's that like takes it to a whole other level. And I have to, 
I, I have to imagine that would be part of this. Yeah, because they were comparing it to HBO now, which right. is, you know, that you don't have to watch. I mean, if it's mobile, yeah, I don't know. They, you know, they were using that as a model and right. that's not, I mean, it's not cloud DVR, I guess. I mean, it's just like you can watch whenever. I can, I know I mention Westworld every day, but yes, I can watch my it's Westworld. It's your favorite show. I know. <laughs> and I haven't seen a single episode because I don't have HBO. I don't give spoilers. It just, just <laughs> pops into my head all the time. I'm sorry. <laughs> That's okay. I really want to see it. Uh, partially because you keep you keep bringing it up. One of these days it will. Um, yeah. Well, and I know that some, some are kind of comparing this to Sling TV, which Sling TV doesn't have the cloud DVR functionality. I don't believe. I think they have limited on demand, but um, so. But I would I would think that because it's Directv, you know, that they probably would. That's a pretty big big part of Directv. So uh, I guess we'll find out. But very good, very good deal. I'd say. Up next, we have a ton of feedback uh, today. So why don't we hear from you? We're gonna listen and uh, read a few of your uh, emails and voicemails. But before that, let's take a minute to thank Epson. They're the sponsor of this episode, Epson's revolutionary cartridge-free EcoTank line of printers for home and office introduce a new age in printing. The EcoTank ET4550 wireless all-in-one printer does not use ink cartridges. Ink cartridges, no more. It features an amazing, innovative, refillable ink tank that earned it the title of CES 2016 Innovation Awards honoree. So you aren't going to get all frustrated with your ink anymore. No more out of ink frustration. It includes up to two years of ink equal to 11,000 black pages or 8,500 color pages. You can save up to 80% on ink with low cost replacement bottles. It just kind of fill up the tanks. That's why it's called Eco Tank. It's powered by precision core printing technology. It has uh, auto two-sided printing, and a 30-page auto document feeder, easy wireless printing from tablets and smartphones. Easy and wireless printing don't always go hand in hand. Here you get that, thankfully. All EcoTank printers deliver an unbeatable combination of convenience and value. With Epson's EcoTank line of printers, you're going to have the freedom to print without running out of ink. The Epson EcoTank system was named the 2016 Small Biz Windows printer of the year. Visit epson.com slash ecotank today to transform the way your home, office, or work group prints for the best combination of ease and value. Turn to the Epson ecotank printers. That's epson.com slash ecotank. We thank Epson for their support. Epson, exceed your vision. So we have uh, some feedback. We just decided to lump it all into a category of its own, and we'll answer a few of them because they were kind of piling up a little bit. So first one we have here, Philip Clark wrote into TNT at twit.tv regarding last week's story about counterfeit Apple accessories being sold through Amazon. Philip says, fulfilled by Amazon is kind of a misnomer. Fulfillment by Amazon is possible by anyone who has a storefront on Amazon, and they are an FBA member who runs a business. What this means is if I am, <clears throat> excuse me, if I am an FBA member, I can go to any place, make purchases, then ship my purchases to the Amazon Fulfillment Distribution Center. Then you order that item uh, that is fulfilled by Amazon from their distribution center, but shipped to that distribution center by me. My sister does this, so I'm pretty familiar with this process. Fulfilled by Amazon does not mean Amazon bought the products like the Apple accessories mentioned in your show. Buyer beware. Um, there's a really good point, and that's a good, you know, kind of pulling back of the curtain because I didn't realize it worked like that. Um, having said that, I mean, you see fulfilled by Amazon. Whether that is the case or not, it's still like from a from a perception uh, perspective, it kind of you you think differently of it because it's fulfilled by Amazon. Right. Yeah. I mean, I, uh, I ordered like a dozen lightning cables, um, for my house. It's and a I, rain and lightning cables. <laughs> it really was. And of course I did that like three weeks ago and there's two left. They just disappear. So they do, oh, really, <laughs> yes, they just get drawn to different rooms. I don't know. <laughs> Who knows? Um, maybe there's a black hole for lightning cables in my house, but I went to the wire cutter, you know, the site mm -hmm. we talked about yesterday and looked at what the best lightning cables were. And that's how I ordered them because, um, you know, they don't have to be from Apple. And yeah, like I said, it's hard to tell what yeah. gonna um you know burn up your phone that you order from amazon so. which you don't no one wants their phone burn up uh by an accessory that just wouldn't be that great no i don't think or their does. phone to burn up because their phone burns up apparently no. because bad batteries mm -hmm. no one wants that either no. well jeff rothman sent us a voicemail about our conversation yesterday about smartwatches 
Hey guys, Jeff from Richmond, Virginia here. Just wanted to uh, weigh in on the conversation you guys were having yesterday about smartwatches. I recently got a Pebble Time and I've been really impressed with the thing. Uh, it's streamlined and quick, uh, shows the weather and tracks my steps and tracks my sleep. And it's been doing a really great job for me so far. The display is always on and really easy to read in the sun. I had Android Wear for a while and that thing would crash all the time and then take two minutes to reboot. And hmm. just was kind of a pain, uh, which is sort of the opposite of what you want for a smartwatch. But the Pebble seems to really have it down pat, just keeping it very simple. So uh, also I got it off of Amazon for like 80 bucks. It was really cheap. So I've been really impressed. I just wanted to throw that out there. Also, uh, the new TNT, I've been loving you guys jason and megan are doing an awesome job so keep it up oh. thank you so much thanks appreciate that i didn't hear the end of that message yeah. so nice. uh we'll play your voicemails even if you don't say nice things about it yeah that's thank true <laughs> but we appreciate all the nice things that you say um i had the Pe pebble time i tested it i liked it then i got the apple watch um so i gave it to tony and he wore the pebble time for a while yeah um yeah, he's big on that yeah i don't think he, now he wears an android watch i think Tony just, yeah, he has a hard time sticking to one wearable well, platform. I he think. wore it for a long time. And I think that's a great advice to buy it yeah. used because, yeah, there are lots of people not wearing theirs anymore. And it's great, especially if you do, if you're not sold to one platform, you know, iOS or Android, like Pebble's a great solution. Yeah, Pebble's the obvious choice there. And I think, you know, has been for quite a few, you know, a decent amount of years. They've really kind of established that as kind of like the cross-platform choice. Where where people criticize Pebble, I think sometimes is in the design aspect. You know, when people are when people start talking about smartwatches or wearables and and kind of the fact that like you're wearing them, so to a certain degree, the style, the fashion, or whatever matters to a lot of people. And some people kind of look at the Pebble Time or the Pebble watches and just kind of in general. They don't look as, I, I don't know if it's a refinement or, or what it is, but sometimes they look a little bit more like a toy as opposed to like an actual timepiece, let's say. Mm -hmm. So there's a little bit of that factor. You probably pay less as a result of that. Like I'm seeing on, uh, on Amazon right now, I could get it Prime for like $89. Cool. Add to cart. Okay. <laughs> I ordered uh, the Pebble Core. I uh, kickstarted that. I wouldn't order it. I, I uh so I don't know when that's coming coming out. I think January. It, when I what is the Pebble Core? Again? It was that little square thing that um, you can attach uh, to your, right. and then you can use like I guess the Amazon Echo with it apparently in some way. So um, you attach can, to your key ring or whatever. Yeah, or yeah, attach yeah. it to you when you run, so you don't have to bring your phone um, with you. Of course, now I'm gonna get the Series Two watch, and I also won't have to bring my phone um, with me. But I was just interested in it. It was like it was. Yeah, so we'll get it. It seemed like a long time ago when I um, <laughs> yeah. when they did the Kickstarter, but I think it'll be coming soon. Yeah, Pebble's good at, at actually delivering on their Kickstarters mm -hmm. uh, because that's pretty much how they've run their business from mm -hmm. day one. Graham writes in and says, I appreciate the huge scale of the Note 7 and the effects it will have on Samsung's coffers, but my thoughts are with the multiple smaller companies who made accessories, cases, that sort of stuff. How much has the fiasco cost them? Let's hope a new Samsung mobile phone can be made with the same dimensions. I'm guessing a new mobile phone by Samsung will not be made by the same dimensions because they rarely, if ever, do that. They always change it in some sort of way. The camera's slightly offset, whatever the case may be. I, I wouldn't hold my breath as far as these accessories, you know, like being like, you know, applying to future models. I suppose it's possible, but I doubt it. Um, I mean, Amazon, for example, there were some people that went to Reddit that basically said, they ordered accessories uh, for the Note 7 when the Note 7 was still being sold. And even though they were outside of the 30-day return window for Amazon, when they contacted Amazon, spoke to support directly about it, Amazon was willing to kind of do a refund and a return and everything. So, um, you know, I guess it, it probably, by and large, depends on where you got it from. And you could probably go in and make a case. Like if you got something from Best Buy, and you have your receipt, I'd be really surprised if you couldn't go back there and be like, look, I got my note here with a case. Can I get a refund on, on both of them? And that they wouldn't do that. Yeah, but I mean, that is a good question because we've talked obviously about the effects of Samsung, you know, the effects on Samsung as a whole of mm -hmm. this recall. We've talked a little bit mm -hmm. about the effects on some of the carriers, um, but we haven't talked about the little guy, like the people yeah. making cases and other accessories. Um, you know, what what's going to become of them. It's like, I, I mean, I don't know. I think a lot of, 
I think that when you go into a store, like cases are often like iPhone because it's like in the U.S. anyway, because there are so many iPhones. So like if you go into a store, you don't see a ton. I don't always see a ton of Android cases when I go into like Target or something. Mm -hmm. um, they're more limited. So I don't think I would doubt if, you know, some, any small company put all their eggs in the Samsung Note 7 case probably. basket. <laughs> but they probably are suffering a little bit with this. For sure. Especially when you consider the fact that a lot of times they get, you know, some of these case makers get the the designs for the new phone before the new phone is even announced, you know. So they've, st they've started work. They put a lot of resources, especially on a phone like the Note 7, which is a absolutely when it came out and, and leading up to it. The, the top tier in the, within the top three, let's say, of uh, flagship devices out there that people, you know, with a lot of money would be willing to buy. iPhone obviously being uh, right up there at the top two. So, you know, there are a lot of accessory makers that really went full board in on Note 7 because that is that is potentially a very, you know, profitable um, device to to latch onto, so it's a really good point. Um, we haven't we haven't seen exactly how that affects them. Uh, related to this email, Samsung we should say announced uh, it is planning on continuing the Note brand in 2017 with the Note 8. Samsung released a statement yesterday saying users who trade up for a Galaxy S7 or an S7 Edge from the Note 7 uh, will be able to trade up for an S8 or a Note 8 through its upgrade program next year. The program, at least according to yesterday's announcement, would only apply to its customers in South Korea. So I don't know if this is going to extend to users outside of that, but I could I could see Samsung at some point trying to make inroads with all sorts of users and just say like, look, this is how we this is how we win you back mm -hmm. uh, in some way, shape, or form. Uh, users would pay pay half the price of the S7 device before exchanging to an S8 uh, or yeah, the Galaxy S8 or the Note 8 uh, as part of that plan. And uh, that's that. Mm -hmm. Three emails and feedbacks and things. And now, fan of the day, which is uh, Sue Z Knits on Twitter, who says she watches TNT while sipping an iced coffee and knitting, of course. It's in her Twitter name. Uh, there we are down in the corner. We're not really you know, taking up mo the majority of the screen, <laughs> so we got to work on that. But I'm sure... Well, she's knitting. I, I know. I'm sure it's. I'm sure that other stuff is important. Apparently, you're leaving me hanging. Yeah, I'm know. waiting for a high five, and I'm not getting one. That's that's sad. I'm it knitting sad. also. Apparently. <laughs> Show us how you watch or listen to TNT. Just record a video or take a picture of yourself or your setup. Post it on Instagram, Google Plus, Twitter, or Facebook, and use the hashtag How I Watch TNT, and we'll find it. Well, five fifty thousand bottles of beer in the self-driving Uber. That'd be a long song. 50,000 bottles of beer. Take one down, <laughs> pass it around. 49,999 <laughs> bottles of beer in self-driving Uber. Wired's Alex <laughs> Davies was part of the maiden voyage of Otto, Uber's self-driving truck that delivered 50,000 beers. Wow. A distance of 120 miles in true level four autonomy. The driver even jokes that he did a little yoga on the ride. Uh, right now, Auto's hardware works on any truck with automatic transmission, but they have some big future plans. Uh, Uber bought Auto, and that's O-T-T-O, for $680 million last summer. Um, right now, they're only autonomous on the highway, and that's kind of the plan for the future as well. So the idea is that they'll be autonomous on the highway, and then a driver will pick them up when they come to town and get in and drive it to its destination through town. So, yeah. But there's going to be a driver in while it's going, right? Uh, well, well, right maybe now, eventually, right? yes. Eventually, the, God, what a weird future it's going to be when yeah. these things are just like, oh, it's it just drove across the country and there it is. No one was inside the entire time. That's going to be normal at mm -hmm. some point. Well, the That's same so thing. Weird. People people were afraid to get into elevators and, you know, there's no one driving the elevator. It's true. That's true. Well, but we're, we're in there pushing a button. <laughs> I don't true. know if that's any. <laughs> that is I don't true. Know if that, yeah, that doesn't work. Um, very cool, though. Do you, does this make beer more or less expensive or more or less delicious? <laughs> uh, less expensive, more delicious. Yeah, I would agree. It's that, been proven. That's right. TNT records live every Monday through Friday at 4 p.m. Pacific, 7 p.m. Eastern, 11 p.m. UTC at twit.tv slash live. You can be part of the show by emailing us at tnt at twit.tv. You can also leave us a short voicemail. And uh, we love when you do 260 TNT show. You can find us on Twitter. We're at Tech News Today TV. 
Twit is now on the Amazon Echo Flash briefing. Every day, get updates on the latest tech news and events from Leo, Jason, and me. To hear the Flash briefing, just go to your settings in your Amazon Echo app, search for Twit, and then subscribe. It is a great way to start your morning. It's short and sweet and none of the nonsense you find here. But you like the nonsense. <laughs> so find all the ways to subscribe to our show at twit.tv slash TNT. And if you want to tweet at me, I'm at Megan Maroney. The nonsense is why they keep coming back. Mm -hmm. At least that's what I tell myself. Mm -hmm. I'm at Jason Howell on Twitter. Thanks to our technical director, as always, Kara Cole. Thanks to Burke for the words on the screen, scrolling them so that we can read them and seem smart. Thanks to Kevin for editing and making us look good. And thanks to you for talking tech with us. We will see y'all tomorrow. Bye, everybody.